reviews. We found them in the Kellogg factory. This looks insane, sticking your hand right inside of the ball in his mouth. Well, last night we got a gentleman, had a gentleman drive up and said there was a bald eagle down on the highway, not too far from Salt Haven here, about uh, five kilometers. And uh, so at that point, you know, everything drops because first of all, the birds buy a highway, he could get hit by a vehicle. And uh, we went out and uh, we brought him back to Salt Haven. Well, I'm gonna wear those, and then when I turn the gloves over to you, I'll put these on. Just okay. remind me to do that in case I forget. Yep. It's a bald eagle. Uh, I believe it's an adult bald eagle. Um, and so what we're doing is we're just rehydrating him. Um, he came in yesterday, and Brian believes there isn't too much wrong with him other than he thinks he has a bruised wing. Um, so what we're doing now is just trying to make him feel a little bit better, and then we'll reassess his feeding schedule after that. And, um, and hopefully he won't be here too long. Hey, Shikoba. So what we're doing now is we're tubing him because he was emaciated and dehydrated. We're not sure what's wrong with him. There doesn't appear to be any fractures, but he's not eating for whatever reason. This one isn't at full strength, and, and so he's not as strong as, as, as say, like um, one that we're ready to release. But uh, if, they, uh, if they do get away from you, or if, uh, if you let go of a foot, then you have uh, the chance of being uh, clawed by them, grabbed or footed. Um, if you don't keep them far enough away, then they have the chance of biting you. They can rip skin really, really easily. They have so much pressure underneath their talons uh, and their beak, and so, um, and so if you're not very cautious with them, then it could be detrimental to those that are around. And so taking full precautions is necessary in order to properly rehabilitate these animals. You, you gotta realize that his guns are his feet. They can exercise almost 700 pounds per square inch gripping strength with those feet. And uh, we, so our first uh, line of defense is to immobilize his feet. You gotta grab both legs at the same time because if you don't, one or the other is gonna get you. And then uh, once we have that, then we have the second thing we have to deal with is his beak because it's powerful and and sharp, and so we uh, we have to be able to hold him in such a way that we're going to be protected first. Especially for raptors, um, we wear gloves, um, long protective gloves, thick gloves, um, and we hold the animals in certain ways so that uh, they can't uh, foot us, uh, grab us, grab us with their talons, um, and we also hold them so their wings are tucked in so they can't um, try to escape, or um, we hold them far, far, away, far enough away so that they don't uh, try to bite us. Control. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in that instant, actually, he tried to uh, try to nip at me when I grabbed him. So it's good that um, uh, when you have longer arms, you can hold them down lower, especially for larger birds like that. Um, and so the precautions are necessary. Um, and especially in this case, we had we don't know exactly what's wrong with him because if it isn't just a bruised wing, um, if it's something toxic, then that's why we wear in the masks. Uh, we wear the gloves so that we protect ourselves as well as protect the animals. This looks insane, sticking your hand right inside of a bald eagle's mouth, but if you put it in the corner, you can't really. Just feeding that tube right down. So we're tubing him, and we're tubing him about every three hours at this point, uh, just to get fluids back into him, and then we'll start him on some food to build up uh, his energy again and see where it goes from there. But right now we're being cautious because it could be anything. It could be West Nile virus. It, you know, we don't know why he's sick. Uh, so that's yet to play out. Okay, 
change the tube so we don't get any backlash there. Uh, he's he's better today than he was yesterday by a long shot. So obviously the re the uh, rehydrating fluids are are having an effect. He seems to be doing well with the electrolytes, and we've only given him. I think that's three three feedings now of of, um, of fluids, and so he seems to be responding well to that. I don't know what Brian's um, uh, time frame for feedings are, but uh, he'll probably move on by the end of tonight uh, to something a little bit more uh, calorie rich um, to try to get his strength back up. I think he's strong enough that whatever is ailing him has just started, and so it's a good time to have got him, gotten him in. We know he can fly. We've seen him fly, not far, maybe only. Uh, maybe only 50 feet. Uh, his legs are good. It, I, I would just say, I would think it would be a good prognosis, but at this point it's too early to tell. Okay. It's exhilarating. It, it's fun to work with animals like that because you don't get to do that every day, especially here. Um, as long as you're careful, uh, it's rewarding because you get to see um, the, uh, your ability to help such a large animal. Because you think in the wild that they don't need any help because they're usually the top of the food chain. But then when they're here, they're injured for some reason. And so to be able to rehabilitate something of that magnitude and then release it again, it's pretty rewarding. Bald eagles don't come to Salt Haven that often. Uh, we maybe see four or five a year. Um, they're just starting to make a comeback to southwestern Ontario after decades of uh, not being here simply because of DDT that was being used in the environment in the late 60s and early 70s. It decimated net, uh, eagle nests. The eggshells were brittle and the nests failed. And uh, so it's just, we're just starting to see bald eagles come back to southwestern Ontario. It's the effort of trying to do something good and leave something good behind. I'm getting to that age now where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there. And <laughs> so I, I have this, this feeling that I'd like to leave something good behind that would n not necessarily be a, um, something attributable to me as much as something that people can sink their teeth into and run with that they can build and embellish and grow. I, I'm grateful for being able to be here today and talk to you about something that's near and dear to my heart, and that's working with wild animals. Um, the environment and resource management course is a bit of a passion that I've had over the years to teach it. If Salt Haven wasn't there, would it make any difference at all? Introducing the students to so many of the topics uh, and, so, and showing them both sides of the issue with our human uh, growth and development on the planet and contrasting that with uh, the economy and the environment. All right. <laughs> any, any questions? One of the things that I ask them to do is to raise awareness in the school community about a topic that they're passionate about. And all of those young ladies chose to do uh, raise awareness about uh, wildlife, rehabilitation, and some of the human impacts that we have. So they shared facts and uh, details about some of the problems that we're creating on the planet. And through that, then they did a fundraising activity so that we could uh, host Salt Haven today. He has these little poems that allow allow the air to actually flow faster through his nostrils so that he can breathe and dive at the same time. I guess I've always had a passion about the subject and I feel like people need to care more about the environment in general and it's good to make an effort to educate other people and yourself. Before the drug class I didn't really know that how much we were actually affecting the environment and then the class may realize that we really are affecting it really badly. Then we have to... I would like to just really help animals, honestly. Like, animals are like my main cause. I really like animals the most. 
I would like people to not eat them and like not be cruel to them and not abuse them and just kind of leave them alone. You know, in the environment, wild animals naturally exist harmoniously for the most part. Everybody knows their boundaries. But when progress on the human level and nature collide, there's always that clash. I just think that the rewards that the students feel from being a part of that, something concrete that they see a difference happening, that it makes them better citizens in the future. <laughs> the Youth Environmental Alliance is a a group of young people, part high school students and part young clinical volunteers at Salt Haven that are going to get together and create short video clips that will teach youth about how to do different things to save the environment, to save wildlife. So with the YEA, my role is a, more of an advisor for the youth that are going to be participating in it. So I'll help them if they have any questions in regards to animals um, and in any capacity in, in that sense. So we'll go to a school and explain um, what uh, our committee's about and then we would give little projects maybe online or to teachers, to students, so that students could gain points by doing certain environmental things such as, um, you know, picking up uh, garbage. Okay, water. And uh, they're also going to turn around and work with the community and different businesses and get prizes donated so that the youth that are able to make changes and convince other people to make changes can have prizes. They're going to gamify the whole thing. They'll be able to relate to us instead of, let's say, an adult, because an adult's like a teacher. But if you have younger students relate to each other, then you can kind of talk the way they do and then, you know, explain things maybe from their point of view, which we've already understood. But the main outcome I would like to see would just basically be um, people being more aware of wildlife. Um, it wasn't until I started volunteering here that I started to notice a lot more animals, a lot more birds, and a lot more the attitudes of all of them around you. And you don't really uh, notice that sort of stuff until you start to look. And so if, once we open their eyes to the, the aspects of, of the environment and the wildlife around them, um, then them being able to actually notice their impact and what they can do to change everything, um, I feel like is a, is a pretty rewarding goal in the end. We can make a difference and we can, if we all come together as a team and one uh, big group, then we can make a difference to our future and the environment. We just have to be more aware of what's going on. Uh, because youth are, are going to be the ambassadors of the future. It's going to be their world and they're also the ones that have the most energy and enthusiasm um, and probably the most reason to commit to to something like this, they'll be able to influence their younger siblings and their parents. Um, and I think there's a huge buy-in from the community to get youth more involved. If you can change people's attitudes on their views on wildlife at a young age, then it will last throughout their entire lifetime. We want to empower them and make sure that they really understand, kind of going, wow, we can do this. Or there is actual wildlife places where we, I can go and volunteer and help out, right? So you want to empower them to make the difference for their future and for the environment future as well. Yeah, the eagle is, um, uh, we were hoping that this was just a bad bruising. It turns out that he has a fracture. It's a, uh, a proximal fracture of the, or a distal fracture, sorry, of the humerus. We palpated first of all. Um, in other words, we just put slight pressure uh, all along the bones to see if there was a fracture. We didn't feel anything. But the, 
the wing was drooping in such a way that I thought, man, we, we better get x-rays done on this just to be sure. And sure enough, when we had the x-rays done, a fracture was evident there. The first one we took, right, so that is the right. right, and then okay. this was um, our side, that one. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, at that point, we realized this is not going to be a quick release. It, uh, it would, here's the, the radius here and the ulna. When usually there's a fracture this close to the joint, there's oftentimes there's joint damage as well. So. That's something that we won't really know about until uh, we uh, do some surgery there. But um, there's definitely a fracture, and it's uh, in the shape of a, almost a Y here. So, and this looks like it could be a bone fragment here as well. There's all kinds of little tiny bone fragments uh, all along that fracture site. So this could be complicated and uh, certainly not as good a prognosis as maybe we would have hoped for. So this makes it a very difficult situation. We're not quite sure yet at this point if, it, if this is going to need uh, surgical intervention or if just wing wrapping. It's, you know, we have two bones in our uh, arm, radius and an ulna, and so do birds in their wing. They have a radius in the ulna, and it's the larger bone, the ulna, that is fractured up near the elbow. Fractures of this nature sometimes will cause joint problems. So the fracture itself will heal, but it also freezes the joint, in which case the bird will never fly again. Um, the other thing is, is that bald eagles eat a lot. And so um, if we have to put him through a six month recovery program, uh, that's gonna be a drain on resources for us too. Uh, it doesn't, we don't make a decision solely based on resources, but it certainly has to, uh, it comes to play here. Um, the other thing is, is that will he be in pain and will he fly again after this uh, procedure is done or after the healing is done? There's going to be some time involved. Uh, it's still a little bit up in the air as to where this is all going to go, but uh, we're, we're hoping that everything's going to be okay. Today we're releasing um, these opossums and uh, they're ready to go now. They're big enough to take care of themselves, they're independent, they're eating well, they're capable of catching their own food, so it's time to go. When these opossums first came in, they were only a couple inches long. Ah, they're so little. They're supposed to be 12 in here, I'm counting. One, two, three, four. <gasps> Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, there was 11 of them in total, uh, but we, uh, we realized that as they got older, we we're going to be hard pressed to be able to take care of all of them effectively given the caging that uh, we have. So we found another wildlife rehabilitator to take five of them. We kept the ones that were in worse shape and uh, got them back on their feet and uh, to the point where today we're going to be able to release them. We're seeing more possums now than we've ever seen before. When they first started coming up about 15, 20 years ago, and now they're a common thing here in Ontario with all the truck traffic that we see. But hopefully, uh, these little guys will do okay and they'll uh, find their little niche and uh, everything will be fine. So we're putting them in a target-rich environment as far as their natural food is concerned. Uh, there's water there, uh, lots of bugs and worms, and. Uh, they love mice, so there'll be field mice there that they'll be able to, to uh, uh, 
feed on as well. So uh, we're doing the best we can for them to give them every opportunity they, they have to survive. They were just little tiny, tiny things. So they didn't have any hair. They're still really young, their eyes were closed. They were doing really well. I definitely think they're really, really cute, especially when they're young. When they get older, they get a bit scarier just because they get the huge crocodile mouth. But yeah, when they're young, they're definitely adorable. Like little tiny little plush toys. Okay, this is a good spot right here. The location we chose to release these possums is uh, ideal. There's, uh, there's water there, there's uh, lots of bugs and, and worms that they'll be able to find. Uh, the river is kind of the lifeblood of, for wildlife and uh, there's, uh, there's mice there, there's field mice, there's open fields. It's, it's got a wide range of uh, topography that they're going to be able to thrive in. You can tell that they're a bit apprehensive just because they've been caged their whole life. So that's all they've really known. So when you take it off, they're kind of like, we, we can't move, can we? We're still in the cage. So they kind of like feel around the edges a bit and then they realize that they can leave. And then once one of them leaves, the rest go, oh, he left. So I guess we can leave. And they all kind of leave one by one. Some of them were kind of a little unsure because all of a sudden there's no ceiling and uh, something they're not used to. They're looking for the edge of the cage. <laughs> but they seem to adapt pretty quick and uh, off they went. So I, I'm very confident that they're going to do just fine. It's a really nice feeling because I guess it's all the work that you put in since they were little tiny babies has paid off. It's a gratification of all the, the work that you put in to see them get to be released. They just saw freedom as something that they really wanted. They didn't hang around. They, as soon as we took the cage tops off, they were out and gone. They're, they're too small to be able to fight off a large predator like a raccoon or something of that nature. But uh, they're, they're quick enough they're sensitive enough that uh, we think that they're going to do just fine. <laughs> it's almost never a good idea to trap an animal and take him to a new area and release him. He doesn't know where the food is, he's unfamiliar with the area, and oftentimes he has to compete for that food and territory as well, and they don't do very well. A much better idea is to just make conditions uncomfortable for the animal to the degree that they want to move on their own. They'll move to an area where they know where the food is and they are going to be comfortable there. I'm Brian Salt, helping you to keep the wild and wildlife. <laughs>